Go Noontide, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green on another beautiful Hawaiian Noontide. Today we have as our guest, Marissa Kutch. She is with the city's resilience office and she is the energy efficiency specialist. So welcome, Marissa. And you know, not everybody has City Honolulu Resilience Office on the tip of their tongues. Why don't you briefly describe what in the world your office does? Because it does a whole heck of a lot of things, all uh, with the goal of achieving 100% clean energy for Hawaii. That's right. Well, Howard, awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, the Resilience Office the abbreviated, abbreviated name, the full name is the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency, but we go by Resilience Office. Um, we were voted into um, city charter by city council in 2016. We cover a variety of areas, um, including energy, uh, building efficiency, disaster mitigation, preparedness, sea level rise. So, um, really just developing resilient infrastructure um, in response to climate change. So um, our office is fairly new to the city, but already just uh, doing a lot in the, in the um, six, seven years that we've been um, a part of the city. And what, what about wastewater treatment? Is that under your office too, or is that another city office? Um, uh, we support other city offices with uh, mm -hmm. wastewater, but um, not directly under our office. Okay, okay. so uh, benchmarking is another word that is not on the tip of everybody's tongue. <laughs> and I was thinking of uh, the easiest, most common possible metaphor for that. And I came up with weight loss. If you're at 130 pounds and you wanna go to 120 pounds, your initial standard is 130 pounds, your goal 120, and then you benchmark yourself pound by pound down until you uh, reach your goal. Is that a good uh, metaphor for uh, benchmarking, a good common way to explain it? I think so. You know, people looking to lose weight, I think that will <laughs> definitely relate with them. <laughs> Um, yeah, building benchmarking is um, the tracking of your energy and water use over time. So you're able to start tracking, build a baseline, and really see how much energy um, you're using over um, weeks or years. And it serves as sort of that starting point to just figuring out how you can best save energy in your building. Um, and then steps to conserve from there, whether you want to get an energy audit, look further into, you know, where exactly is all of that energy waste going, um, or maybe you're ready to start an energy efficiency project, you know, you want to upgrade those um, old, maybe incandescent light bulbs to LEDs, and you would be able to see the energy savings from projects like that over time. Somehow the phrase, uh, what you, you can't master what you can't measure. So you are measuring things so that you can uh, master them. Could you give us a real simple example of what a, a benchmarker su such as yourself would uh, do? Do you actually make an appointment and go visit the building in question? And that starts out with the building manager being motivated, in, in this case, to save energy. Is that how it works? You go off, go over and visit them or you collect data first or what? What, can you give us a step-by-step -step process here? Totally. Yeah, great question. Um, so we start by gathering all of the data. Um, this is the first year that the program is required by um, the city and county mm -hmm. of Honolulu. So this year, buildings 100,000 square feet and above are being required to report their gas, electricity, and water usage. So we start by collecting that data. Um, you're past the first deadline, which was June 30th of this year. So our office is um, kind of going through, cleaning up any possible data discrepancies, and we'll actually be ready to publish that data in 
uh, late fall of this year, so aiming for November 1st. Um, and from there, once the data is public, our office will be supporting buildings and sort of next steps on what to do with that benchmarking data and connecting them with other stakeholders such as Hawaii Energy, who would be able to support with different rebates and different energy saving opportunities for their building. And does the city have that many buildings over 100,000 square feet? There are there are quite a few. This year really? on the mm. reporting list, we have just over 430 buildings being over required to. Oh, oh, this is both private sector and public sector. So oh, this okay. is, that's right. So the ordinance includes commercial buildings and multifamily buildings. So wow. that includes sectors, hospitals, mm -hmm. condo buildings, um, office buildings. And on the list this year, it's over 430 buildings being required wow. to report. Wow, I knew we were a big city. I didn't know we were that big. <laughs> what would a hundred thousand square foot uh, building look like, say a residential? Would that be go up to what about sixteen floors, the normal uh, height limit? What would a typical yeah. residence, high rise residence, be how, in size? Yeah, the household residence. Mm, I would definitely say it depends the how many floors are in the building, but mm. I would say we're we're looking at condo buildings that are over 15 right. um, floors and that total over 100,000 square feet in gross floor area. So that gross floor area is including all um, in-unit square footage as well as the common area square footage. Mm -hmm. Like the, the lobby and, and so forth. Exactly, if hallways. There's any, uh, if there's retail space on the first floor, that certainly is included also. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so now you've collected the data and presumably you have a motivated building manager and he has some dollars in his pocket with which to carry out recommended uh, measures. What, uh, where, where do you go from here now after you've collected the data? Yeah, from here we, we connect them with um, other local stakeholders, Hoi Energy, Board of Water Supply, um, even HECO has different incentive programs for reducing energy consumption or mm -hmm. installing renewable energy sources. Um, so Hawaii Energy, they have residential programs, business programs to help um, install energy efficiency projects. So that could be lighting, mm -hmm. maybe you wanna upgrade your AC, install controls, maybe a building's interested in an energy audit. So we would connect them with um, other, other stakeholders who could support in um, the actions of saving energy. Just a, in a small instance of that, say re residentially, a uh, homeowner wants, needs a new refrigerator. His old one is kind of failing and they know it's not efficient. So they go to the hardware store and they select generally, oh, you now have signs, not you, but Hawaii Energy has signs mm -hmm. above the requisite refrigerator saying, I believe it's a $250 rebate. And yeah, so the, so the, the rebates is, are a deal. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah. They're they're called um, instant rebates. So instead of applying for a rebate online and being reimbursed later on, the rebate is actually applied at checkout. So if you go to different participating retailers, um, different Energy Star models of refrigerators, mm -hmm. you would be able to receive that that rebate directly at checkout. So um, the the rebates are a great deal. And if you're purchasing from an Energy Star certified model, um, you're looking at some of the higher efficiency standards under under the EPA. So those are recommended models for saving energy. And then back to your 100,000 square foot building, if it's centrally air conditioned and that AC system is old, I believe number one, well, you're gonna to have to have an engineer uh, come in and recommend this for a retrofit. And then once it's, uh, done, approved, 
I believe Hawaii Energy's rebate is going to be way, way, way up in the thousands of dollars to incentivize the owner to select the most efficient uh, system. Exactly. Um, the Hawaii Energy rebate would definitely be significant um, due to the size of the project. Um, Central AC would be considered a, a larger efficiency project. You'd definitely be saving a lot of energy and therefore the rebate would uh, reward you um, in that sense for supporting such a high energy saving project. Mm -hmm. So um, even, uh, you know, getting an audit, if you were to pursue an ASHRAE level two energy audit, um, a contractor would be able to offer different model options for replacements and they would actually be able to show the potential energy savings um, that you would save by switching models or retrofitting or upgrading. So in, in um, par parallel to that, they would highlight the Hawaii energy rebate that would be um, supported for the project as well. And in a simpler rebate for a high rise, let's say this is an office with hundreds and hundreds of fluorescent tubes up there in the ceiling. And those tubes are 10, 12 years old. What what happens then? If if recommended. If if definitely in the energy audit, um, they would recommend switching to LEDs and even installing controls or motion sensors for hallways um, or even common areas during times of off-peak hours. And the, the rebate would be significant as well. Um, depending on the type of lighting, a customer could receive um, a standard rebate. So it would be a set rebate amount per lamp that is installed and replaced, or um, there's also a custom rebate route. So um, depending on the energy savings, there would be um, um, a monetary multiplier to, to get that rebate. So there's two routes. Hawaii Energy um, is definitely open to um, further talking about the opportunities there. So definitely recommend um, those who are participating in the benchmarking program to next steps, go to Hawaii Energy for um, a further energy analysis of, of their building. And let's get back to benchmarking. So you've got all of this information now and I guess the information must be broken out by energy use sector say for uh, an off high-rise office building of course you're going to have a separate circuit for your air conditioning system you might have a separate circuit for uh, lighting and, and so forth but you've done your benchmarking you're looking at a bunch of numbers how do you determine where your big energy savings is, is going to occur? Mm, that's a good question. Um, it's a, so if you're a building manager and you've sort of done that analysis on your own, you might look at your current fiscal year budget and what you're able to um, to support for the following year. Maybe you need a couple years um, a funding to support a larger project. So definitely funding is one of the first things that building managers um, look at when they're looking to install um, or retrofit uh, different projects. Um, but two, if you're looking at an audit that you've received from a contractor, uh, mm -hmm. the audit will outline the highest energy saving opportunities. And from there, a building would be able to review um, sort of the cost benefit, the payment over time and then the Hawaii energy rebate that's associated with it. So um, I would say it definitely depends, um, you know, as an energy effic efficiency specialist, I'm encouraging the highest energy saving projects. Those will be um, giving you the, the highest reward in the shortest amount of time. But of course, there's other, um, other items to consider, such as budget and uh, what's feasible for the year. And then you mentioned uh, overtime. I, I guess that's an allowable expense because if you're going to change out the lights in an office building, that's not very convenient if everybody's at their desk and you're, the workers are moving letters all over the place. So you've got to schedule, say, them the workers to come in at, say, 6 p.m. and get out of there by uh, 
5 a.m., something like that, and that evolves over time. And that's then, right. And uh, then retrofitting the AC system, now that's pretty uh, tricky. You need to move any, everybody out by 5 in the a, a, on a Friday afternoon and get your hoist up there and everything like that and hopefully get the building cool again by uh, Monday morning. Is, is that kind of how that works from an overtime standpoint and you factor that into the budget? I think typically, yeah, you know, contractors that are requested to work outside of the typical nine to five um, time period, you know, it would be, it would typically be factored into the project costs um, if they're working, say, odd hours or, or after the standard hours. Um, so I would say definitely varies, varies per contractor. And then... Yeah, when you get into the details of this benchmarking, I, you, you mentioned having an auditor do this. So I would describe an, an auditor's report as a very sophisticated method of benchmarking. Is that a good conclusion? You're, you're not yeah. just uh, look, looking at bills, you're, you're looking at specific equipment. And... That's right. The, so, you know, to start with benchmarking, it's sort of the big picture, just how much energy is my building using? Um, you're able to compare with other similar sized buildings. So office buildings that were built around the same year, they have similar hours of operation, um, similar functions. You know, you would be able to compare how much energy you're using to your neighbor. And say a neighbor is using a significant um, amount of energy, much higher than their neighbor. The next step would be to look into further detail, you know, really where is all of that energy being used? Um, is it is it the lighting? Is it the AC, the central AC? And that's really what the energy audit would point out is sort of those details um, and the different uh, opportunities for saving energy. Um, benchmarking builds the baseline, gives you a perspective of how you're doing compared to other similar sized buildings and then the energy audit really points out exactly what needs to be done to start saving energy over time. And that that would be could be a real incentive for the facilities manager because if he gets this report and he is generally say has 10% higher utility costs than the comparable neighbors the boss is going to look at him and say, hey, what is going on here? Why are we, are we wasting money here? So that, that's real good incentive to, to launch the program. That's right. And even, you know, condo buildings. Um, I'm thinking of just the condo building that I live in and other buildings around that are built similar years. And um, older, a lot of older buildings are are here in Honolulu. So um, I think it really would point out an opportunity to um, just not encourage competition, but more just um, encouraging you to talk story with your neighbor, learn, you know, what are some efforts you've done in the last couple of years to save energy and uh, just kind of provides that community atmosphere to encourage energy efficiency and encourage conversation around it. Um, so just in my personal experience with my building, um, you know, there's a lot of projects that we would like to do and just learning from our neighbors, um, it helps encourage us to talk more in our board meetings, sort of what priorities should be and um, maybe just the process of, of starting an energy efficiency project. Because mm -hmm. um, as you know, there's various stakeholders to go through, budget to consider. So definitely just talking about it with your with your neighbors and in different sectors is a great place to start. And factored into the energy audit is the estimated cost of undertaking this uh, retrofit and the estimated uh, payback time. Of course, here in Hawaii, we're paying 43 cents a kilowatt hour, which makes payback times <laughs> rather short, to put it mildly. <laughs> Generally speaking, do boards or whoever is the decision maker, do they pick the lowest hanging fruit first or do they mix lowest hanging fruit with longer payback times to come out with, with a uh, a nice average, uh, an attractive average? 
Another great question. You know, it, it really depends. Um, definitely boards have a lot to consider in their building. Um, a lot of equipment is aging, so maybe um, projects are done based on failure of equipment and um, they're not necessarily done up front. So sometimes they're prioritized based on need. Um, other times it's just, it's again, budget for the year and what are they able to um, pursue for that, for that budget year. Um, so var variable. <laughs> yeah. And you, you mentioned uh, water efficiency. It's not uncommon for a high-rise residential unit for uh, a resident, say, on the lower floors to come in to their bathroom and see a mini waterfall going down the wall. Hmm, what is going on here? <laughs> so there's your, that, now we're into what's called the uh, health and safety issues. So that becomes a very high priority very quickly, and it may result in, in a lot of plumbing uh, retrofits and maybe efficiency retrofits, but it's an emergency that, that uh, tr triggers the event. Exactly, exactly. It's just, um, yeah, you want to be one, one step ahead of those accidents, but of course, mm -hmm. things happen and um, you just kind of have to mitigate <laughs> from there, but water efficiency water efficiency is is the other side of of the benchmarking program so um besides saving electricity um we are encouraging buildings to also reach out to the board of water supply they also have uh residential and commercial rebate programs for saving mm -hmm. water so that's um you know the the low flow toilets um various various appliances that buildings can install either in their common areas or in unit to mm -hmm. water and save on your water bill. Yeah. Do you have any idea in that instance, say high-rise residential, the huge majority of the water use is within each residence, each living unit. And generally speaking, this is America, you cannot force people to do something like change to low, low flow uh, shower heads or low, low flow faucets. Do you have any idea how that is uh, accomplished? That the, a board would make a decision and then try to persuade everybody to go along and give them a financial incentive? Yeah, it's that's tough, you know, especially being in units. Um, owners in unit, they make decisions specifically for their unit. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage um, not only just saving water and saving money for um, for boards to communicate to their residents, but also just living on an island and water is such a precious resource. We all should sort of take on that responsibility to conserve water and mm -hmm. um, feel like we can directly make an impact in our in our units. So um, I think saving money, but also just that general sense of responsibility that uh, we should all be taking steps to conserve water. Yeah. And well, you, you and I have in common, we need to instill that sense of urgency in into the people we're uh, reaching out to. And exactly. it's, uh, I just finished uh, another book on the subject, and the author did not use this analogy, but if one is going to get pessimistic about people undertaking energy efficiency projects seriously, they might require the environmental equivalent of a Pearl Harbor. Mm. That will instill uh, motivation in people very very quickly. And uh, I, I'm a historian. I happen to be very certain that uh, President Roosevelt had to let Pearl Harbor happen because mm -hmm. otherwise there was an isolationist uh, feeling throughout the nation and they didn't want anything to do with another war after World War I. But uh, with Pearl Harbor, boom, it mobilized the nation. So something is going to have to mobilize us to take similar drastic uh, actions. Have you ever it's, contemplated exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. 
you know, maybe it's it's crossed my mind once, but um, to to each their own on kind of where that sense of responsibility comes from, right? If it's mm-hmm. serving your greater community or if it's saving a couple dollars on your water bill, um, I, I definitely encourage residents to kind of find that that encouragement and motivation for saving energy or saving energy and water. Yeah, that word motivation in with us in the energy office comes up uh, very, very, very often there. Well, yeah. we're reaching the end of our show. Do you have any last words of wisdom? Oh, you know what? Do you have a website you can bring up to show people how to get hold of you? This is, um, I guess, communicating to buildings that are participating in the benchmarking program this year, um, or if you would just like to voluntarily start benchmarking your building. Um, Our office, the resilience office with the city and county of Honolulu is here to help. So any questions you have on how to benchmark, where do I get started? What are the requirements? um, We are here definitely to support you. So you can visit our website. It's www.resilientoahu.org backslash benchmarking. So you can find several resources to start benchmarking, um, learn how to use Energy Star Portfolio Manager to um, build out your building profile. And then um, there's different methods to contact uh, me directly if you have questions on the benchmarking program. And on that very, very cheerful note, we need to bid on adieu. Marissa Kunch, thank you very, very much. And thank the Resilience Office for doing absolutely great work. And we will see you next time. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.